Hey, we're in the middle of a series, and this series is just called A Different Way. And let me give you the genesis. of. I told you this story before on week one, but we do, like today, uh, we have our soft launch of small groups. And so launch, uh, small groups are starting next week at East Coast, but you have about 112 or 117 groups to choose from. And, but several of the groups that we do are called freedom groups. And um, free, if someone were to ask me, what group should I go to? I would say, hey, if you're going to pick any group and you're not sure, go to a freedom group. You'll get the most return for your investment at a freedom group. And so, but the freedom group, um, and there's bunches of them, but they last 10 weeks and they end with a Saturday kind of a conference type thing. Well, I was at this conference. We do it here at the church, and other churches come a part of that as well sometimes. And, and so I'm there, and my part to speak at the conference, just a 30-minute session, but I'm speaking at two, about 2.35, I think, or so. So I show up about 2.15, and I'm in the back of the room, kind of getting ready, kind of getting the feel for it to, 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 do, to do my session. And then right in the middle, a guy walks up to me and goes, hey, pastor, I got an issue. I said, what's that? He said, If I would have learned what I've learned in this freedom group 15 years ago, my walk with the Lord would have been so much better. Why didn't you tell me this 15 years ago? I said, well, you didn't come here 15 years ago. No, I didn't say that, but I was thinking that. But the thing about it is, is that this is where a lot of us, we're, we're, we're serving the Lord and we're walking with the Lord and we're like, we're not enjoying it. We're not experiencing the freedom of that. That's sort of the genesis for this series. And, and Paul, he wrote this letter to the church of Galatia. And he wrote this letter because there was a church and they were doing the same thing that the American church does today. There's a lot of people that are on fire for the Lord. But there's also a lot of people that are there out of duty and obligation. They don't want to be there, but they're there because they, they don't want to go to hell. They want to go to heaven. And so Paul wrote this letter and our text has been this one verse. He said, I am shocked that you are turning away so soon from God who called you to himself through the love and mercy of Christ. You are following, and this is where the series title came from, a different way. Like he's almost, he said, you're following a different way that pretends to be the good news, but it's not the good news at all. He says, hey, you're being fooled by people. And here's what he, he almost in this letter and the whole context of the letter is about this, this, this mindset. There's almost like two brands of Christianity, two different kind of gospels out there and two different ways of doing Christianity. And one is one way is out of obligation and out of duty, and I just don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven, but I don't love anything about it. I don't even like going to church. I don't like worshiping. I don't like reading my Bible. I'll do it because I have to. I'm following the rules. The other one is sort of a relationship deal, where you're in relationship with the Lord, and in this relationship, you enjoy it. Like, you enjoy Christianity. You enjoy serving the Lord. You don't go to church because you have to, but you like to. You don't give because you have to, but but you want to worship God. You don't pray because it's a duty, and if you don't, God's going to get you. You pray because you want to get close to God. There's sort of, one is, one is, I'll say it to you like this, one is dead religion, and the other is relationship. And you sort of have this, you go, well, that would never be me. I, I, I have relationship. I would never, and in fact, Paul calls out a leader of the church back then. His name was Barnabas. Barnabas was a major leader. Last week, if you were here, we talked about this. He, and he, he said, even Barnabas, you've gotten fooled. He said, you used to have this relationship, but now you're following just all the rules, and it can happen to all of us. He said, well, it would never happen to me. We have to be on guard. This is why we're doing this series. It's kind of like, you ever, you know, when you're raised by your parents, you go, when I become a parent, I'll never do that. And then, lo and behold, one day you're like, wait, I'm my dad. And that's, we say, well, I would never have dead religion. I would never just do a relation. I would never just follow God out of rules. But a lot of us are trying to earn our way to God. And there's this incredible truth. And last week we talked about this. Last week we talked about really how to live in freedom. How to live in freedom. Today, I want to talk about Really, and I want to dedicate this message to anybody here that's struggling staying in freedom, struggling staying in, in a relationship with the Lord where it's on fire for him. Like you want to keep it on fire, but it keeps going back and forth. And, and you, you want to go to heaven, you don't want to go to hell, and you really want to get close to God, but you're struggling. And, and so everything becomes rules. And if, you, if I just follow, if I get in enough small groups, if I, re, if I read my Bible enough, if I give enough, if I pray enough, if I serve enough, if I don't ever miss church and everything's gonna be okay. And, and, and your relationship with the Lord feels dead. I wanna dedicate this message to you. There's this verse in the book of Titus and it's a powerful verse. Paul wrote here, he said, hey, for the grace of God, 
He said, there's something about God. It's called grace. It offers salvation and to all the people, which all of us go, well, that's what I want. I want salvation because, but hey, there's more to this thing than just salvation. Grace doesn't just get you to heaven. There's something more. It teaches us to say no. All the things that we're struggling with in life, he said there's something more to grace. Grace isn't just a ticket to get to heaven. Grace doesn't just get you out of hell. He said it does something more. It helps you say no to the things that you don't want in your life, the ungodliness and the worldly passions, and and to live. This is it. We want to live this life, a self-controlled and upright and godly life in this present age. Here's what he's saying to you. There's a grace that's available, and instead of just doing things out of obligation and duty, here's what he's saying. The things you should do, you'll want to do now. Christianity just isn't, uh, oh, I got to do all these rules. You know, all those things that we're supposed to do as Christians, pray, read our Bible, serve. He goes, hey, if you could get into this grace, if you could experience grace beyond just salvation, beyond just getting to heaven, then all the rules that you ought to do, now you're going to, to want to do. When I went to Bible school, now, when I went, Pastor Gwen and I went to the same Bible college in Miss Karen, and there was about 2,000 students back there when we went there. And um, when we went there, I was dating, and Dean and I, we didn't know each other, and we were dating other people and this sort of thing, because there, when I went to school, it was called Rama Bible Training Center, the acronym RBTC. Well, there used to be a joke back then. Instead of Rama Bible, it was called Rama Bridal Training Center. And so the idea was, if you're going to go in the ministry, this is where you'd meet your husband. This is where you'd meet your wife. And so Dean and me, you're dating other people. And then we, her and me, I always liked her. Finally asked her, I got enough courage to ask her. We went on a date. And for her, it was love at first sight. And uh, this kid, and um, not really. It was the other way around. And, but here's the deal. Once on our third date, and I've never done this, but on our third date, I just knew this is it. This is the one for me. And all of a sudden, all those other girls, can I just say this to you? You know, it's not that they weren't great. It's not that they were amazing, but all those other girls, it's not that I couldn't date them anymore. I didn't want to date them anymore. It's not that I, I couldn't be, for, I, I couldn't go out with them. I didn't want to, because why? I, want, I belong to her. And here's what I'm saying about Christ, Christianity. A lot of us are following the rules because we have to, not because we want to. What if there was something where, hey, you have this grace available where you don't have to, you would enjoy it. And so Paul, now this whole, the whole theme of, of Galatians is this sort of this argument about do you follow by rules or do you go by relationship? And so Paul is getting really strong here. In Galatians chapter three, and he goes, he's on this topic and he goes, oh foolish Galatians. Now, theologians will tell you something about Paul. Most of his letters are kind. Most of his letters are full of theology and he's always grace and peace and love. I miss you, I care about you. But they say something's different about the book of Galatians. He's coming in real fatherly. He's coming in real harsh. And how about starting off a conversation, you fool? That's what he's doing here. That's how strong it is. He goes, oh, foolish Galatians, who has cast an evil spell on you? Almost makes me think like, like the Disney movies. Like they, they, they'd cast, you know, the witch would cast a spell on a prince and turn him into a frog. Here's what he's saying. The, the spell made you turn into something you really aren't. And what Paul is saying here, who put this spell on you because you're becoming something you were never meant to be. You're, you're turning into something that's not who you are and you're frustrated. For the meaning of Jesus Christ's death was made as clear to you as if you had seen a picture of his death on the cross. He said, you know what this is all about. He said, let me ask you just one question. He said, I gotta ask you this one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by following all the rules? Did you get saved because you kept all the rules? Did you get saved by obeying the law of Moses? Of course not. He said, you receive the Spirit because you believe the message you heard about Christ. And he's, and he's just so strong. How foolish can you be after starting your Christian lives in the Spirit? Why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? In other words, did you get saved because you were so good or did you get saved because you put your faith in Jesus? He said, did you get saved because you kept all the rules and joined the right church or did you get saved because you put your faith in Christ? He said, there's like two different brands of Christianity. One is going there because of who I am and what I do, and the other is saying it's because of what Jesus did. Now, here's the end result, and, and we don't like this 
this kind of a church, but if you're the kind of person who says, I'm saved because of all the things that I do, an unintended result is this, that you become judgmental and critical of other people. It's, almost, it's, it's the church where how many small groups do you go to? I go to three. Well, how many do you go to? One, barely. I don't even do that usually. And it's almost like, well, you're a lesser class of a Christian. You don't even mean to, but you'll become judgmental. This is why we got to revisit this message of grace every so often. We got to remember where we were and where we are now. You see, see, see I, I don't know. Like, do you know the gospel message? And the, let me explain to you in a, in a nutshell the gospel message, as easy and as simple as simply as I can. See, we were created. God created us with a need. There's a beacon. There's a need on the inside of us to connect to God. And, and, and on the same time, God created us to be in relationship with him. He wants us to be in relationship with him. He wants it, we want it. But there's something in between. It's called sin. And here's the deal about sin. God and sin don't mix. And so God had to figure this out. He wants to be with us. We want to be with him. But we got this thing in between called sin. And that's where Jesus comes into the equation. And Jesus became our sin. So now we can have this unfettered access. And God's not only our creator, now he's our father because of Jesus. Now let me explain it to you like this. Let me give you an illustration. It's kind of like this. Say you leave church today and you're coming down to Loma and the speed limit's 40 miles an hour and you, you get caught. A cop gives you, checks you out on radar and you're going 47 miles an hour and he gives you a ticket. For you. He says, hey, I'll see you in court in 30 days. You show up in court in 30 days. Now when you go to court, here's what's in a courtroom. There's the judge and the judge is there because he wants to give you a fair trial. He's going to find out if you're innocent or guilty. Also in the courtroom, there's typically the defense attorney. The defense attorney represents the accused. The accused is the person who's done something wrong. And then, and then there's the deprosecuting attorney. They're there to make sure the state's represented. They're there to make sure you get what's coming to you. So let me give you the illustration. You went speeding. You're 47 miles over. You're going 47 and 40. You get a ticket. You did it. So you show up in the courtroom. Now there's the judge. Let's just say in this case, the judge is God the Father. Let's say you are the accused. Let's say Jesus is your defense attorney. Let's say Satan is the prosecutor. He's, he's the state attorney. And so he gets in the court and you walk in and the judge says, hey, Norm, you got this ticket. You got 47 miles an hour. Were you, did you do that? Are you guilty? Yes, sir, I did do that. Now, the prosecuting attorney doesn't have to say anything. He's quiet because he knows he's got me. I did it. I got caught. The defense attorney knows I'm wrong. What else are they going to say? They can't get me out of this. It's almost like, hey, you're going to do something about this? No, I'm guilty. And so the judge, now listen, because the judge is a righteous judge, because the judge is a fair judge, the judge knows I've done wrong, and he's getting ready to pronounce judgment on me for what I did wrong. And just at that moment, the defense attorney stands up and goes, hey, 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 I got something to say, judge. He said, what's that? He goes, he's guilty. He did it. He deserves the fine. But I want to pay it for him. I'm going to pay it. Yeah, but you didn't do it. I know, but I want to pay it for him. You mean you're going to, you didn't speed? You mean you're going to pay the price for him even though you're innocent, even though you're not guilty? Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Can I tell you something? That's a picture of the gospel right there. You're guilty. You did it wrong. You have a judge. He knows you did it wrong. You have a prosecuting attorney that saw you do it wrong. But a defense attorney steps in and goes, I'm going to pay the price for you. That's what the God, and I know there's some people in here who are going to say, well, wait, I don't even speed that much. I don't speed that, I mean, seven over, really? Hey, you're in a winter springs, I be, be, know that. And, um, but I only speed when I'm late for work. I only speed when there's an emergency. I only speed when Chick-fil-A is getting ready to close. <laughs> and I wanna get there. I don't speed that much. So I don't do, I really, here's what the scripture says, James chapter two and verse 10. For the person who keeps all of the laws, except one, is as guilty as the person who has broken all of God's laws. See, if you live the perfect life on this earth, if you just never made a mistake, and you got to heaven one day and said, hey Jesus, I lived the perfect life. Can I just tell you something? When you finally got up there, pride would take you out. 
In other words, here's what he's saying. All of us, all of us need a savior. And that's, that's what grace is. And in the reality, I'll say it to you like this. Your actions, what Paul was saying was, your actions do not cure the sin problem. Like, if you could earn your way, we'd all figure that out. But your actions can't earn, you can't earn your way to deal with the sin in your life. Paul, again, he's writing. Same, same chapter, he's dealing with this. And he said, okay, he's making this argument. Let me put it another way. He's just writing like a pastor. Let me, let me communicate this a different way to you. The law, all the rules, that was our guardian until Christ came. All the rules were there until Jesus came. It protected us until we could, and here it is, until we could be made right. Here it is, not do right, be made right. Let me tell you the secret of Christianity right now. Here it is. Secret of Christianity is not behavior modification, it's transformation on the inside. It's not that you're gonna do the rules, not that you're gonna do right, you're gonna be made right on the inside. That's what grace is. He said, we get this with God through faith, and now that the way of faith has come, we no longer need, like we don't need all those rules to get to God anymore. We don't need to prove, because we've been made right on the inside of it. Here's what I'm saying. R- rules will not solve the sin problem. But here's what will. Grace solves the sin problem. There's this issue we have, we're so far away from God. How do we get close to God? See, human nature is, I'll just be good. I'll just be good. And if I'm just good enough, then God will take me. Can I tell you something? None of us are good enough to get to God. We all have this sin issue and it keeps cropping up over and over and over again. And in fact, honestly, if you study all the major religions of the world, I have, all of them want to get to God. Even the ones you think are bad, they want to get to God. All of all the world's major religions say there is a God and we got to figure out how to get to him. And so what they typically do, world's religion, this is what they do. They all, if you study them, they all go to the rules. If you do enough of this, if you do enough, if you pray enough, if you give enough, if you serve enough, if you help this many people, then you can get to God. You got to earn your way to him. But the difference with Christianity, it stands alone. Christianity from all the other major religions of the world, it stands alone and based on this, that you don't do the rules, you go to the person of Jesus Christ. That's what you do. You just go to the person of Jesus Christ. And that's why the most important part of our church service is always at the end. We work hard to see hands raised. Because you know what happens? Something happens unique. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17 says, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ, here it is, doesn't get a new set of rules. They become a new person. And here's where he said, the old life is gone and a new life has begun. Like he said, you, you can have this, this new life. And so the question that I think I would want to know is, like, how do, I, how do I experience this? How do I walk in this? How do I get to that next level where grace isn't a get out of hell card and a get into heaven card? I want to have this new life. I want, to, I want to enjoy my relationship with the Lord. I don't want to just follow all the rules. I don't want to make, I don't want prayer and Bible reading and giving and serving and helping to be a duty and obligation. I want it to be something that I enjoy. He said, grace could do that for you. Then the Bible is going to give you some insight on how to do this. And in Ephesians chapter 2, a very famous verse in the Bible that most of you know, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, it says, it is, for it is by grace that you have been saved. Well, we all know that. That's true. Yeah, grace saved us. But then he said something different here. He said, you get this through faith. Notice what he didn't say. You get this through belief. You don't get this through belief. The, listen, the Bible says the devil He believes in God. I'm pretty sure he's not saved. It's not believing in God. It's not, you don't get this through going. He says, you get this not by acknowledging that God exists, not by going to church. He says, you get this one way. You get this through faith. And it's not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. This word faith is a different kind of a word. This word faith is a unique word. And the fact it's not belief. This word faith means I trust in. This word faith, it simply means that I, not only do I believe in God, but I trust in God and I experience grace. I I don't need just to, 
I'm going to cross a line of safety, and I'm going to go all in for God. I'm going to cross this line and say, God, I'm yours. And all my faults and all the things that I struggle with, I don't get right and I don't get perfect, but I'm going to cross the line of safety, and I'm going all in. He said, that person who puts their trust in God, he said, they're going to experience a grace at a level that goes beyond just salvation. Let me explain it to you like this. If you have children, you know what I mean. If you don't have children, you might not understand this, but I'll do my best to explain it to you. See, when you get married, you're committed. You're committed and you're committed to your spouse, and that is true. But hey, can I tell you something? When you add children to the mix, it goes to a whole nother level of commitment. And so I always laugh, because here's what I'm saying. When you have children, you're crossing the line of safety. There's no retreat. And I always laugh because we have staff, young staff, and they go, oh man, I'm getting so tired of paying for diapers and I'm getting so tired of paying for formula. I can't wait till my baby's out of formula and my baby's out of diapers. I'm going to be rich. I said, my man, it's too late to warn you. It only gets more expensive from here. Diapers and formula, kids play clothes and car, your insurance bill, with weddings, it gets in out of control. It's a lifetime commitment. You, you cross the line of safety. Here's what I'm saying to you. It's an all-in thing. He said, this person, if you want this kind of grace, you don't get it for raising your hand and praying a prayer. You get this by putting your trust in him. Lord, I'm giving my life to you. He said, this is a gift, by the way. He said, by the way, I need you to warn you something. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. He said, I need need to keep reminding you, once you put your trust in him, you're gonna wanna go flip back and go, well, I'm a good enough Christian. I've earned it, and so I deserve it. In other words, here's the reality of it is, is you're gonna have this battle going on did God do it or do I earn it? He said, you got to cross the line once and for all and say, it's a gift from him. I'm going to give you four thoughts on how, to, on how to experience this, how to walk this out in a real practical way. What I've just done for you, the best I know how, is to give you the theology of grace. And it should have been a five-week series. I did it in about 20 minutes. And that's, we, in other words, we have a Savior. We, we, we have a God. We are sinners. We need to get to God. How do we get to God? Through Jesus. Well, you're not good enough, so you have to have a gift to you. Here's four things I need you to know. If you want to walk in this radical grace, if you want to get to the place where you walk in a relationship with God, not because you have to, but because you want to. Want to. You don't do things that you ought to do. You do things that you want to do. Now, I'm not saying you won't ever have disciplines in your life. You won't ever have to do some things that you don't want to do, but I'm simply saying is this, there's a whole nother level of relationship available out there where you don't have to serve God, you want to serve God. Number one is this, you need to remember that grace is a gift. It's simple. Grace is a gift that you cannot earn it. And, and the thing about it is, I don't know, it's mostly an American gospel where we try to earn the grace of God. I call it, a lot of people, and this is kind of how I viewed heaven, I call it the 51% heaven. That means this, that you get to heaven if 51% of your actions on this earth are good and 49% are bad or less. In other words, every time you do something bad, you try to earn it by doing something good. You try to earn your way closer to God really by doing something good. And we live in a, I get it, we live in a performance society. Everything you do is reviewed. You have a business, you're on Google. Everyone's going to review you. You, you. you go to school, you're going to have tests. You're going to get a report card, you're going to be reviewed. You, you go, you're on Facebook, people are going to review you. You, you, uh, you uh, have a job, you're going to get job performance review. Everything is reviewed. and You're always trying to perform to appro- get someone to approve of you. And so I get it. We live in that culture where you've got to earn it. But I don't know what it is with Christians. We try to keep on earning God's approval. When he said, hey, grace is a gift. Here's the deal. Romans chapter six and verse 23 says, for the wages of sin is death. Like, here, here's the reason why you need Jesus. Because the wages of sin are death. You need Jesus because you can't pay the price. But the Free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And and you know, it's kind of like this. You you see this on news every once in a while. It's like a firefighter. They'll run into a burning building and they'll save people. 
And then they will die in that burning building. It'll crash on them. We call them heroes. You know why we call them heroes? Is because they willfully ran into that building to save someone. You, you've, you've read stories where you see like a car coming down the street and a kid's playing on his bike and a hero jumps in front of that car and pushes that bicycle out of the way and the car runs them over and they die trying to save that kid. We call them a hero. You know why? Because they stepped in the way of someone else's problems. And that's really what Jesus did on the cross. I think we make the cross so cliche. I think we say, Jesus died on the cross. We get so used to hearing that. We don't recognize and realize. I hope we never take it for for granted that it's a gift from him. That he went to the cross, never sinned. He died a brutal death on that cross. He didn't deserve it. He, He shouldn't have been there. You and I should have been there. But Jesus went and paid the price so you and I could be sitting here today without guilt or shame or condemnation, knowing that when we we die, we can die in peace because we're going to go to heaven. Honestly, I think, here's what I think. I think sometimes we should like, when we mention the cross, like we should, yeah, let's give Jesus some praise for going to the cross, not just on Easter. Because it's a big deal. I don't, here, 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 let me take you back to the story 2,000 years ago. And I'll tell, I'll, I'll take you back there by telling you a story of my life. My oldest daughter, who's 24 right now, when she was about two years old, she became really ill. And uh, I, was, I was a Bible school dean and, and I was traveling across the United States in, in around the world about once a month. And, 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 uh, and so I was gone a lot and she was sick a lot and she had these massive high fevers. We could never figure out what was wrong with her. I got many, many phone calls in different places of the world where she's sick again. And man, I try to get home as fast as I can. And, and we finally found out what was wrong with her. And so, and so they, she, she used to have these quarterly tests and they would have to, she'd go to the hospital when she was younger and have these tests just to measure if it was advancing or not, the sickness. And so, and, and by the way, she's, she's completely fine now. But so, 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 so she would have to be put under anesthesia. And so they'd have to give her an intravenous vein, deal through her vein, you know. And, and so, and it was always an issue. And so we would let, let our parents, they'd let us go into the room where they would hold, I'd have to hold her down where they would have to put these, these needles into her arms. And I remember this one time in particular, I walk into the room, we set her into the room, and we lay her down on the bed, and I have to hold her down where these nurses and medical professionals come in, and they're jabbing her, trying to, get, trying to get a vein to take the needle. And they couldn't do it, and they kept jabbing her over and over and over again, and I'm having to hold her down. And she's crying. And if you know two-year-olds, daddy, daddy, daddy. And then she finally connects with me, and I'm having to hold her down with her, jabbing her. And, and, and she didn't say it, but she looked at me one time, I still, I, knew, I remember the hospital we were at, I remember the room, I remember the faces of the people in the room, even to this day as I'm telling you this story, 22 years later. She finally connects with me, she didn't say it, but this is what I felt like her thoughts were. Why are you letting them do this to me? You have the power to stop it. And I'm pretty polite, finally I said, Stop! And they go, no, sir. I said, no, you stop. You get, another, you get a doctor or somebody in this room. You stop right now. Bleeding, holes in her arms, and they're not getting it. Now, here's what I want to tell you something. I did something as a father that God didn't do. God didn't stop when Jesus hung on the cross. Do you remember the time, if you remember the story, where Jesus cried out, my God, my God, Why have you forsaken me? Here's what I'm saying to you. Grace is free, but it's not cheap. We we get it, and it's free. It's a gift, but it costs something. Here's another thought. That here it is. Everyone qualifies for grace. Everyone can get this. Because the enemy will come and say, well, you don't qualify. Romans chapter 10 says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There's not a person in here that doesn't qualify for grace. Well, you know, the reason that we have to have grace, honestly, is because no one, no one's gonna pay the price for you. No one loves you like Jesus. Well, 
And I hope we can be that church. Come on, everybody. Can we be that church where everyone is welcome in our church? We don't have to be a church they look like us, they dress like us, they're further along in the walk with the Lord like us. Come on. I remember, now we were in another facility, and only a few of you remember this. But before we moved into this building, we had another building, and it was about, this is about a 51,000 square foot building, and we could seat about 1,000 in this sanctuary. And, and, so, and so the other one, our old building was about a little more than 12,000, almost 13,000. 13,000 square feet, somewhere in there. And so we could, we could see about a fourth of the group. So we had multiple services all day, Sunday, all those things with services. And no matter what we did, there were certain services that were really crowded, some that were empty. And, and so this one service, it was super crowded. You just like this. And so out in the lobby, now our lobby, it wasn't much bigger than this part of the stage. It was that crowded, right? Pat, you know, I remember those days. And so, and, so, and so this guy walked up to me in the lobby, super crowded. And he goes, hey, pastor, I got an issue. No, I'm super, everyone's running all over the place. I just got through his services. I'm getting ready to go into a couple more services after that. He goes, I got an issue. I said, what's that? He said, someone is out smoking in the parking lot. Do something about it. I said, someone's smoking in the parking lot. Awesome. That, help, that blesses me. He goes, what? What kind of church? I said, we're a church where people smoking in the parking lot are, you know what we should do? Let's put ashtrays out there. Because we want everybody welcome at East Coast Believers Church. Let's never be a church that exists just for us. Let's be a church that exists for people who are not yet here. Do you know why this is a big deal? Because everyone needs a savior. Not just people who look like us and act like us and are raised like us. Everyone needs a savior. And so, here's the third thing here. Two more and we're done. Five minutes and 20 seconds, 19. Here we go. Grace is experienced through Jesus only. It only comes one way. It only comes through Jesus. You can't earn it. This is a big deal. There's no other way because we are living in a culture today that says this. Hey, church, you can have your church services. You can believe in your God. You can live your life the way you want to live. But we're going to have you do something that the early church had to deal with. You can do all you want, but don't talk about that Jesus too much. And so if you're part of this church and you're part of this church family, here's what I want you to know. We're going to keep on magnifying Jesus. We're going to keep on lifting up the name of Jesus because you know what? Jesus is the one who brought us all together. We, we come from all walks of life. We come from, there's rich people in here, poor people in here, middle class people in here. There's white people, there's black people, there's Hispanic people, there's Asian people here. There's people that are married. There are people that are divorced. There are people that are remarried. There are people that are single. They're young, they're old, people with kids, people without kids. You know what we all got in common? Jesus. That's what could bring us all together. We might not all believe the same. We might not all vote the same. We might not all live in the same community, but we all love Jesus. And so here's the verse. Galatians 2 says, I do not treat the grace of God as meaningless. Look, this is a big deal. For if keeping the law could make us right, like following all the rules could make us right with God, then there would be no need, here it is, for Christ to die. This is all about him. And so the early church dealt with the same thing that the modern day church is dealing with. Have your church services. Believe in your God. Join. But come on, don't bring Jesus into the community. And you even see it on a national stage. You can pray. You can pray to a God in heaven, but don't pray to a God in heaven in the name of Jesus. And I'm just letting you know, as long as you're a part of East Coast Believers Church, we're going to keep on magnifying the name of Jesus every time. We're going to sing about him. We're going to preach it. We're going to preach about him. We're going to pray to God in his name. We're going to do miracles all in his name. We have authority. It's really all his name. Here, here's, here's what they said. They knew it in the early church. They said that in Acts chapter 4 and verse 18, they said, then they called them in again and they commanded them, hey, you can have your church services. You can pray. You can gather, but don't speak or teach at all about the name of Jesus. And this is why I love this quote. There's a quote by famous theologian, Gordon MacDonald. He said, the world can do almost anything as well as the church, which is true. You, need, you don't need to be a Christian to build houses, to feed the hungry or heal the sick. There is only one thing that the world cannot do. It cannot offer grace. This is why. 
Here's my commitment to you as a pastor. Whenever you give, because we give a lot of money away. I mean, we help the poor at a level, and statistically that's triple, almost quadruple what the national level is as a church. We make a difference in the lives of people. I mean, not just the Dream Center, that's just icing on the cake, but we're doing things at a level. I mean, making sure people, orphans and widows and helping people through situations. I mean, you just, you'd be proud of your church. But here's my commitment to you. We don't ever give food without connecting it to Jesus. We don't ever, we just remodeled a home. We don't do it without connecting it to Jesus. Everything we do, we connect it to Jesus. Because you can feed someone, but if you don't connect them to Jesus, you just solved a temporary issue. You didn't solve the eternal issue. I'm not saying go to the other extreme and just be about eternity only. Just preach and let them be hungry. We connect them together. Because here's what, the world can feed, the world can build, the world can help people, but they can't offer grace. Let me wrap up. Here's my last thought in one minute. Remember this, that grace never expires. Why is this an important deal? Because we keep making mistakes. I need you to know something. Your sins, your past, present, and future sins aren't bigger than God's grace. Your past, present, and future mistakes aren't bigger than who God is. Grace never has an expiration date. Food might have an expiration date. You ever, you know, not much in our house. We have five kids and all their friends over all the time. And so nothing expires in our house. It's just gone. It doesn't expire. It's just like, where does that go? And, um, but you know, if you ever have, you check the food, does that expire? Because you know it's, gonna, it's, it's past its usefulness. I need you to know something. Grace never expires. It covers your past, present, and future. Why is this important? Because we keep making mistakes. We keep getting it wrong. He doesn't. There's a verse, and I love this verse, and it's the most quoted verse in the Bible. And they would say, if you were to Google the most memorized verse in the Bible, this is the one that would come up. And you know what it is. For God so loved the world that he gave. And here's what I need you to know. You need to connect this. As long as God loves, he's going to keep on giving. So does God ever quit loving? He said, hey, if whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And I love that verse. But I think the verse after it, it doesn't articulate really what verse 16, but articulates a whole different thought that's connected to it. And it says, for God did not. Hey, you need to remember, he did love, but let me just give you the opposing view. He did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Like this whole thing about grace isn't about how bad you are, how rotten you are. He sent his son in the world not to condemn him because the world already knows. We already know we're making mistakes. We already know we're wrong. He said, but that the world through him, here it is, that we might be saved. Your past your present and your future is all paid for in Jesus. Would you bow your heads and close? I want to pray for you. Father, there's a moment right now where there's some people, as I mentioned a moment ago, they're going to cross the line, across the line of safety and say, man, I've served God. I love God, but I haven't gone all the way. I haven't put complete trust on him. I know on the other side of crossing that line of safety, I feel what I, what I feel, what I want to communicate, Lord, is what I think what you're saying is grace is calling us deeper. Grace is calling us a little bit more into you. And so, Father, there's some decisions for some of us to make. We're going to go a little deeper in you. And so, Heavenly Father, would you speak to our hearts right now by your Holy Spirit? And if that's, if there's anyone here that says, hey, I'm going to go deeper. I'm talking to the saved. I'm talking to those that are in right relationship with God. But you want to go a little bit further and you walk with him and just put a little bit more trust in him. On the other side of that is more grace for you. I thank you, Father, for that person. I thank you for those individuals that are watching online, Lord, that you'd speak to us.